You know, someone just said to me a moment ago, this may be the best service we ever had. You know who it was? The man recording tonight. He's been in every one of them. He's recorded 80 sermons for me since he bought the equipment under the direction of the Holy Spirit. I really believe that. I believe that God used Daniel to get us started in this ministry. This worldwide internet ministry and we're watching the numbers go up every week of, of viewers in fact now I have a notification on my phone Daniel for our new subscribers and on the way to church tonight I turned on my phone and he gave the name I won't mention it but new subscriber and you know it was a man who used to sit several years ago, over three years ago, on my left. He's the man, well, I might as well tell you, Mike, who tells us where the lost sheep lunch will be every day. The old Mike has watched all of our sermons, and Mike said, man, I sure, sure miss the sermon. And you know what he put down there? Beloved. He used to kid me. He said, why do you call everybody beloved? I quit doing that some months ago. But when I wrote the newsletter to my people every Monday morning after the Sunday service, I'd write a newsletter I would send out that they would receive before the next Sunday. They got it in the mail. And... Uh, my secretary asked me the same thing one day. She said, I notice you always start everything with beloved. You know, I got all these newsletters from all these different churches, different pastors, and, and they'd, they'd start out, you know, with a greeting, dear friends or whatever. But I said, well, I got that from the Apostle Paul. Reading the New Testament when he would write letters, beloved. That included everybody of every color, both Jew and Gentile, everybody in Paul's known world, some of these circular letters that we've been reading from in Galatians, that all these different churches in Galatia were to receive. Now, they didn't, they didn't have email. They didn't have Gmail. They didn't have the Internet. They didn't have a website. Sometimes they probably didn't get it for weeks or even months. Think about that. But they got the letter. And Paul always opened up, beloved. Do you know that was a word that was only used of a brother or a sister in Christ? Now, a while ago when we were welcoming everybody and hugging everybody and greeting everybody, those are the beloved. See? Those are part of the body of Christ. Not all the body of Christ beats here. We're just a little part of it. Okay? But we're a part of the body, and the Bible says we're the bride of Christ. We're his bride. You think we're not important to him? You know, when Paul reminds the Ephesians, we're to, the husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Woo! Boy. You know what my wife tells me all the time? She reminds me, when you love me as much as Christ loved the church, I'll do anything you say. <laughs> because I know you won't ask me to do anything other than what God wants me to do. Now that was a pretty good answer, don't you think? You can use that, okay? <laughs> uh, Marina, you could use that on Joe, okay? <laughs> but you see, the Bible gives us, I like to call, divine directions. You know when all else fails when you buy something and you can't get it to work, oh, I'll figure it out. It's simple. And you fool with it for an hour. You go, I don't know why I can't get those batteries in the right way, you know. Like, you know, my wife bought one of these can openers for the battery operated, you know, that you just hook on the can. This has been several years ago when they first came out, and it'll walk around the edge of the can, you know, and 
the lid will drop in and you just reach in with a knife and just lift the lid out. No mess, no bust, no fuss. Oh, it was great. When we finally figured out we had to push that little button before you put it on the can, we got it to work. See, when all else fails, read the directions. <laughs> now, that's what we need to do as Christians. You wonder why we challenge people to read their Bible every day. You wonder why we say, get the Bible app on your phone. The verse of the day, the verse of the day comes up every morning on my Bible app. I have it set up when I go in to turn on my iPhone, before I check my mail, before I check my messages, I read the Bible app. Now it's from the Bible app that I'm reading this scripture tonight in the New Living Translation in the third chapter of Galatians beginning, if you will, with me at verse 5 in the third chapter. He said, I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? In other words, because we're doing something to deserve God's favor? His answer, of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. You see, any way you cut it, from beginning to end, faith is the victory. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. It all starts. You can't behave it till you believe it. Amen. Now when I see a guy who's weak in faith, I know something's wrong with his faith because he doesn't take God at his word. He's fearful. He's in doubt that God will keep his promise. You know, we're all tempted by the devil to think that we're a special case. The Lord really wasn't talking about us. You know, we're just different to everybody else. Well, that's a lie straight out of hell. Listen to this. Of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. See, there's something about the message that we're trying to share from this place, through the internet, through YouTube. There's something about this message that is life-changing, that gives life to people who are still walking in darkness. Now he says in the next verse, in the same way, Abraham believed God. He's giving an illustration from the Old Testament. My wife taught a wonderful lesson today, if I do say so, not because she's sitting here, but because it's so. She taught a wonderful lesson on Abraham and Isaac in our Bible study in the senior department this morning. She went back to Genesis chapter 22, and it was great. I wish you could have been there. But notice he says, in the same way, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Wasn't because of anything he'd ever done or that he was ever going to do. The real children of Abraham, he says, then, notice the comma in the translation, the real children of faith then are what? Are those who put their faith in God. I want to ask you tonight, are you a child of God? I want to ask all my friends who are listening tonight by way of YouTube and the internet, are you a child of God? Can you say in the words of an old song my mother used to sing when she would be in the kitchen getting a meal? My father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands of rubies and diamonds of silver and gold, his coffers are full. He has riches untold. Then it has a chorus. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the king. And you know the verse I always loved? A tent or a cottage, 
Why should I care? They're building a mansion for me over there. Oh boy. Now I'm not gonna keep singing. I don't have time to do that tonight. You don't wanna hear it anyway. If you say amen, I'm gonna lock the door. <laughs> All right, I know. Now in the same way Abraham believed God. Now we see the real children of Abraham. All right, what does he say in verse eight? Let's continue now. What's more, the scripture looked forward to the time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. The Gentiles, not just the Jews, not just those people's special promise and privilege and purpose. Hope you'll write that down. <laughs> but by God's power, the Gentiles, by the same power, the same God, through the same kind of faith that Abraham had, are able to experience miracles too. Now God provided for Abraham, he'll provide for us. Now notice this. But those who depend on what the law can do to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scripture said, Cursed is everyone who does not observe all the law and obey it all, all the commandments that are written in God's book of the law. Now, if you go back and read that book, what is the book of the law, Darth? Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. The books of the law. What God gave his children. You know, the scripture tells us in this very book, the law was added till the seed, singular, not seeds, plural. The law was added till the seed should come. Then he tells us who the seed is in that verse, which is Christ. Christ, his messianic title, the one that God promised. The one was to come and Take away the sin of the world. Now you see the only way we can get rid of sin and a sinful nature is through the one who came to take away the sin of the world. Now you don't have to be a brain surgeon to figure that out. Amen? Amen. Now why do we think that we have anything to do with it when the scripture is so clear on this truth? I mentioned again, I want to say it tonight, just to review for a moment, for those who were not here, who maybe who haven't heard the message. And I say, how you doing, buddy? When I go to the meeting, you know? 12 step. Well, I'm trying, preacher. I'm still trying. I'm doing better. I said, that's your problem. You got it, Greg? Quit trying. See, we walk by faith, not by sight. The just shall live by faith. We don't just get saved. We don't have new life because of, we live that life that God has given us through his presence and power by the same faith that we started with. Now, that's Paul's whole argument, see? The false teachers of the churches of Galatia that were spreading all these rumors that you have to be circumcised. We're going to read about that in a moment. You had to keep the whole law. You had to be circumcised like all the other Jews. you got to fulfill that commandment, that law, in order to be right with God. Well, he said, don't believe it for a minute. Now, but Christ, verse 13, has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on that cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. Now, listen, friend, we're going to see movies in a few days and that are being produced or have been produced about the death of Christ. We've seen some in years past at this season of the year. We're approaching that day. We're approaching Easter Sunday when the Lord won the victory after he'd given himself on the cross, came out of that tomb, victorious over sin and death. Victorious over sin on the cross, victorious over death, at the empty tomb. 
You see, being saved means I have a twofold victory. A victory over sin and death. No more sinning, no more dying. That's what we have to look forward to. One day, there'll be no more temptation. Satan's going to be bound and cast into the bottomless pit. Listen to the scripture. This is the exact quote out of the King James. Never to deceive the nations anymore. Praise God. Hallelujah. See, he's a deceiver. He lied to Adam and Eve. He's still peddling the same old lie to people today. Let's read that 13th verse again. Boy, that's a good one. You want to mark it in your Bible. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Now, if you'll look the cross-references, your footnotes, you'll find it in the Old Testament. Through Christ Jesus, notice he uses two names here in reference to, to our Lord. Christ, the promised Savior, Jesus. His Savior name. The Bible says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, because he shall save his people from their sins. That's why we've got to talk about Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus. The King of Kings is He. The Lord of Lords Supreme. Throughout eternity. The Great I Am. The Way. The Truth. The Life. The Door. Let's talk about Jesus evermore. I got to text from Russell Spatz who usually leads our music on Sunday night. You know, the big guy with the beard? <laughs> he said, I'm up in New York. He finally got in after three days of canceled flights and waiting at the airport. Had to come home. Spent all after all evening, one evening, and finally gave it up because he canceled all his flights. But he finally got out of here because he said, I'm in New York getting ready to do the message. You know what he means by that? About Jesus. About Jesus. So it's through Christ Jesus that God blessed us as Gentiles. We were heathen. We were without the light. We were without the law. So we have to come through the same way that Abraham came that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit. Now we've talked about our subject, the Holy Spirit in the Christian life. Now how do we, how do we start out? We've got to receive Him first. Now go back over your notes from last Sunday night. It's receiving the Holy Spirit by faith. Dear brothers and sisters, he said in verse 18, Here's an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or amend an irrevocable agreement, so it is in this case. God gave the promise to Abraham and his child, singular, Abraham and Isaac. And that, of course, means Christ. This is what I'm trying to say. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later, when God gave the law to Moses, God would be breaking the promise. For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. Now, friend, you know, sometimes you wonder why I'm not reading from the old King James or the New American Standard. I'll tell you why. Because in our language, in everyday language, this translator says it exactly. This is the living New Testament. The recovery Bible is the living New Testament translation. 
All right, now notice again. I just have to throw that in every once in a while. But God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. Now what did he promise his disciples before he went away? He said, if I go away, I'll send another. And the Greek means another of the same kind, just like I am. I've been with you three and a half years approximately. You've heard my messages. You've seen my miracles. I've been with you. I'm going to send you another comforter. What must have been comforting before the Lord said that when he was there, you know, and they were, remember out on the sea in that little, little ship and they about to sink because the waves were coming in and swamping the ship. <laughs> and they saw Jesus walking on the water. They said, Lord, save us. We're about to perish. We're going to drown. What did Jesus do? He stood up and said, peace, be still. That's what Jesus, when we're about to, when we feel swamped, God, I just can't take any more. I felt that way this week. I said, Lord, I've had enough of the wheelchair. I've had enough of all this stuff. I'm sick and tired of spending four, hour, four hours doing something I used to do in 40 minutes. I just confessed it right out in the garage. I said, Lord, I'm just tired of it. Then I said, Lord, please forgive me. I'm still flesh, brother. I get reminded every day. I'm still flesh. I'm still reminded of what Paul said in Romans 8. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So quit trying to flesh it, as I said last Sunday night. F-L-E-S-H. Quit trying to flesh it. And remember, we got to faith it. we got to faith it. we got to trust him. Well, then why was the law given? Look at verse 19. I'm going to finish this chapter, Lord willing. It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. Now the law says, thou shalt not, whatever, and we've done it. That means we're a sinner. How many times do you have to lie to be a liar? Okay. All liars, raise your hand. That's all I was, isn't it? All thieves. How many times do you have to steal to be a thief? All thieves, raise your hand. Do you ever steal an answer off somebody's paper? You know, we call it cheating. <laughs> Did you ever cheat in school? You got stuck and you peeked across the aisle? Yeah, I got caught cheating. Not a very happy experience, is it? It's too bad there's not a perfect human being, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, Lord. Are you about to? I believe some of you are about to get it. I can see it on your face. After all these years I've been preaching, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to learn that I can watch people's reaction and response, if you want to use that word, how they respond to the truth. You know, pretty soon I say, yeah, they've been there, they've done that. <laughs> you know, I don't have to listen to a testimony for 30 minutes on Friday night in the AA meeting. I don't have to sit around the table. I've heard somebody tell it so many times. I know their testimony better than they do. I'm not kidding you. I remember some of the things better than they remember. And I want to say that isn't the way you put it the last time I heard it. <laughs> now look. God gave us the law. Why was it given? Again, verse 19. It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. Now he's already told us who that is. Jesus. Now look. God gave his law through angels to Moses who was the mediator between God and the people. Moses was a mediator. Did you know that? Between God and the people. Yeah. Now the Bible says in the New Testament 
that Jesus is a mediator of a new covenant. See, a new covenant Christian, it's a brand new thing in the new covenant. In the New Testament, a new covenant believer is one who has been saved under the new covenant. Under the Christ, the mediator. Oh, I love that, buddy. There's one mediator between God and man. You read that verse? The man Christ Jesus. All right. Now, friend, I know this is just, we're laboring through it verse by verse. And you all are great. You just keep listening. Bless your heart. But I want you to get it so good that you can flip over when you're witnessing to a family member or a friend or a stranger and say, by the way, let me show you this verse in the Bible. You know, there's something about not only hearing it, but seeing it. Now listen. I used to love when I was witnessing to people as a pastor. Oh, I hope I didn't lose that. I got it. I used to love to say, do you have a Bible? You know, I'd keep mine in my pocket, you know. Oh, yes, I have one. Sometimes I'd have to blow it off because it was sitting on the coffee table full of pictures, you know. <laughs> they never read it. I'm talking about a lot of people that, you know, they were, they were christened when they were babies into the church, but they were never converted. They never personally put their trust in Jesus. They never invited him to come into their heart. They never opened the door of their heart. And it was obvious to me, so I would take some of these scriptures just like this. I mean, there's more than, you know, just the Roman road to salvation, for heaven's sake. There's more than one way to show people what Paul said here, a man who was converted, who by his testimony said, of sinners I am chief. He was a chief. And he was brought up with the law. And he still blew it. Still blew it. The law never did save him. Never could save him. So he's writing now and he says, A mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, see, Father, Son, and Spirit, did not use a mediator when he gave the promise to Abraham. Is there a conflict in between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scripture declares that we are all prisoners of sin, so we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Now, you know, friend, it doesn't do any good to talk about being filled with the Spirit you don't possess and praying to be filled with the Spirit you don't possess. Stay with me now. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, to us in the new covenant, we were placed under guard by the law. Talking about the Jewish believers. See? They were under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Protective custody. Let me put it another way, Paul said. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. See, he keeps repeating this. See? And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. Praise God. Hallelujah. For you are children, all of you, children of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ. Now we've got to spend just a little time in closing on this. Baptism. 
You know, Paul tells us as he writes to the Ephesians, there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. What is the one baptism? Well, I've heard of people who I was sprinkled, I was baptized. Or they poured water on my head, I was baptized. Or I was immersed in water, I was baptized. It's all baptism, depending on which doctrine or denomination you follow. But the Bible speaks of one baptism. Let me tell you where it is. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Very important now. For by one Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, for by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body. And all made to drink of one Spirit, capital S. So when we're baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ, you remember, you remember what John the Baptist said, the one who prepared the way for Jesus? In the opening verses of the Gospels, there's one coming after me, John said, who is mightier than I, who shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and fire, cleansing. What is the baptism of the Is it a second experience? Is it a second work of grace? Absolutely not. It's always used with one reference. Conversion. Now I know there are a lot of so-called great theologians who say it's a second experience. I have a lot of friends who preach that. They're still my brother. It's amazing you know, how much false <laughs> preaching you can put out and still be a child of God. The point is, you've got to go back to the beginning. How did you start? See, Paul said, having begun in the Spirit, do you think now you're made perfect by the flesh? See, it's how you start that makes a difference. Amen? Yeah. You've got to get the right start. It's not walking down an aisle, shaking the preacher's hand, making a, quote, profession of faith in Christ, even if it's a public profession, it's a matter of when you, in your heart, say, Lord, come into my heart. You don't have to say it in these words, but this is what it has to be. Cleanse my heart. Take control of my heart. I want to live for you the rest of my life. Please, Lord, I open the door of my heart. And after I read some of these scriptures, I'll pray with people around the kitchen table. I love that. Sometimes they give you a Coke or a cup of coffee or make you a sandwich, depending on what time of day it is, you know. And I've seen people just get out of the chair and fall on their knees without me even telling them that. I've seen children that I was talking with in my study when I'd say, son, do you really want to be saved? He said, yes, sir. I'm thinking of little Jimmy at Water Tower Baptist in St. Louis. I said, how bad, Jimmy, do you want to be saved? He said, pretty bad. I said, bad enough to turn your life over to Jesus? He said, yes, sir. I said, will you kneel down here with me right now? And boy, he prayed. And I'm going to tell you, son, a year later, he got baptized in the water. But you know when he got baptized in the Spirit? See, he was christened as a Catholic, as a baby. His daddy would let him come to church, but he told him he couldn't join that Baptist church. You can go to Sunday school and hear the preacher preach, and then you can come home. He lived a block and a half from the church. You can almost throw a rock on his house from the church door. Do you know who the last boy I baptized before I left that church after eight years of ministry? It was Jimmy. Do you know why I baptized him? Because his daddy called me on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> now get this. This will break your heart, man. He said, is this Reverend Miller at Water Tower Baptist Church? I said, yes, sir. He said, this is Jimmy's dad. This was, this was after the Sunday morning service that was to be my last Sunday before I moved to Mobile, Alabama. 
I said, well, the reason I asked you, Jimmy, we have a lot of Jimmys in our church, you know. And I, I didn't know who it was. He said, do you remember you came to my house and talked with me? I said, oh, yes, I do remember. And he said, you know, Jimmy's been coming down there for more than a year. He sets his alarm clock so he can get up. He said, I don't wake him up. I don't get him dressed. He dresses himself and he gets up and comes to Sunday school. I said, well, I'm glad to hear that. He said, Jimmy tells me that, that you're going to be leaving the church. This is your last Sunday. I said, yes, sir. It's my last Sunday. He said, preacher, I want to ask you, do you really think that Jimmy knows what he's doing? I said, well, let me tell you, I think you've already answered that question. To make a long story short, Jimmy showed up that night with a grocery sack, a Kroger grocery sack with his underwear in it because he knew we had robes. We were in the dressing room upstairs at the close of the service, getting ready to baptize. <laughs> he said, you told me that day, and I can see him pointing his finger, if I just go home and let my daddy know that my life was different, that someday he'd let me be baptized. <laughs> oh, Jimmy was so excited, man, he just, you know, and I said, I hugged him and he cried, and I cried, we all cried. For the life of me, if I live to be 10 million years old with the Lord, and I plan to, I'll never forget that night. You know, it was sort of like the Lord was showing me that I'd been right all these years. He was affirming to me that I hadn't preached something that wasn't so. That Jimmy had understood. Now he was probably nine or ten at this time because he was in the junior department. He couldn't have been any older than that. And I remember I never did get to talk to his dad anymore after that. I've often wished that I could have. I've often wondered about Jimmy. I really have. But I'll tell you what. If the Lord questions me about Jimmy at the judgment, I want to say, Lord, don't you remember that night that Jimmy, or that morning that Jimmy came into my study from his Sunday school class and said, I need to talk to you about being saved. His Sunday school teacher sent him down to my study to talk to me. Boy, the responsibility, friend, of rightly dividing the word of truth. I've been reminded more ways than you can imagine about how important it is to preach the truth. And I want to say to you tonight, in these closing moments, that before we go, there are some in TV land that need to hear this. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children. That's what Paul said. The last verse of that third chapter. You are his heirs and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Friend, I want you to know you can be saved tonight or tomorrow or whenever you listen to this message. If God speaks to your heart and you say, you know, I'm one of those church members. Or maybe you were you were christened or whatever when you were a child. And maybe you're a true believer tonight. But maybe you're not. That's my concern. Paul teaches us in the New Testament that we're to examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith. Now we've talked a lot about faith tonight. To be in the faith, there has to be a beginning. There has to be a point when you stepped into the faith. 
So the Christian life is beginning in the Spirit by faith. Beginning in the Spirit. That's going to be the title of our message. Beginning in the Spirit by faith. And I pray that tonight, if you've never had this experience, even as you look at me right now, at the close of this message, that you will just say in your mind, in your heart, Father, I don't believe I've ever had that experience. But if I've never really understood before, I do now. And I want to turn my life over to you completely, ask you to forgive every sin that I've ever committed, come into my heart, take control of my heart, and right now, Lord, as I bow before you, I ask you, if I die before morning, to save me. In Jesus' name, amen. And remember this verse, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're praying for you tonight. We'll be praying for you in the days to come. I urge you to make this decision before it's eternally too late. God says, my spirit will not always strive with man. Now listen to this. For after he is also flesh, flesh. My spirit shall not always strive with me. There's going to come a day when friend, it'll be too late. I don't, want to, I don't want to drag this out, but you know, the Bible says that it was in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, in Noah's story, God shut the door. And I can just see the multitudes it came when it was too late. And the rains were falling and the floods came up. Knocking at the door. Let us in. Let us in. We believe you now. Too late. There's going to be a day when it's too late. That's why I preach a little longer sometimes. If I look out and see somebody that I've been praying for or talking with. And I see them sitting in the service when I was a pastor. I would say, Lord, don't let them leave tonight. And we say, I'd say, let's just sing one more verse. Just one more verse. We sing for you. What's our number? 294. 294. What you need to say tonight, my friend, if you're a Christian, have thine own way, Lord. I'm, I'm coming back to walk with you and live for you, serve you with what's left of my life. But if you've never trusted him, you've never made a beginning, tonight's the time to start. Okay, God bless. We're singing for you. We're waiting for you.
refreshing to us. received him into their heart who would not believe like little Jimmy that if he would just ask him he would come in and change his life. Give him a desire to serve Jesus and love Jesus and live for him the rest of their life. Friend, if that's what you want, he's ready to receive you. When you're ready to receive him, Father, we pray tonight again for everyone who listens, who's listening now, who will listen in the days to come. Holy Spirit, we pray that you'll convince them of your word, not because Carrie Miller said it, but because God said it in his word. And his word is true and we believe it. And we've never been sorry one step of the way that we followed Jesus and began our journey with him. May their journey begin tonight if they've never received it. It's our prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Bring somebody with you next, next Sunday. could help us a lot if you'd put your books back and look around you and see that everything's just like you found it when you came in. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Pastor. I tried to teach people that as pastor. Leave it like you found it. Thank you. 